So we're reading uh, Luke chapter 4, starting at verse uh, 14 and through to verse 28, or 30 actually. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I say to you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephah in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And now for the reading and interpretation, we have with us Jesus Bar Joseph. He was one of my students in Torah class, and we've heard reports some of them very positive of his rabbinic journey. <laughs> Jesus. Thank you, Rabbi Benjamin. Ah, peace. You know, it's not easy to share in front of Nazareth's most preeminent rabbi, but I'll do my best. And I'm certain that uh, if I miss a word or two, one of you at least will speak up, huh? Oh, don't worry. I wonder who it will be. A reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to the opening of the prison for those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The fulfillment of this scripture, as you have heard it, is today. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is a year of jubilee, a year the poor, the brokenhearted, the captive, and the blind are offered redemption. Here, now. We are with you. Keep going. Not bad for a carpenter's son, yes? <laughs> I mean, especially Joseph. May he rest in peace. Jesus, please explain why you stopped the reading before Isaiah spoke of the day of vengeance of our God. 
Especially during a time of such oppression. The day of vengeance is in the future. I'm not here for vengeance. I'm here for salvation. You're here for salvation? What are you saying? You know what I'm saying. And this year of Jubilee, this year of the Lord's favor, is not about release from financial debts. I'm here to provide release from spiritual debt. We're the chosen seed of Abraham. We don't have spiritual debt. Jesus. Yes, Adam. We've been hearing about the signs and wonders. And now this? Are you claiming to be more than a rabbi? More than even the baptizer? No doubt one of you will quote me the proverb, Physician, heal yourself. The things we heard you did in Capernaum and in Syria, do here in your hometown. Yes? Why not? I get it. It's always easier to accept hard truths and even greatness from strangers than from those you know well, especially those you knew as awkward teenagers or even as adults, as some of you saw earlier today. Last year would make a more believable prophet. <laughs> but this brings up an important truth. No prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Be careful with what you call yourself. This should be easy to prove. Dinah and Rafi, you say you saw it, yes? Yes. Yes, we saw it, but he did not claim this. A true prophet from Adonai would not deny his own people's signs and wonders. Listen carefully. When a great famine hit Israel during the days of Elijah, Three years and six months, there were many widows, yes? And we know how the Father cares for his chosen people, especially widows. But Elijah was sent to none of them, not a one. Instead, he was sent to a widow in Sidon, in Zarephath, a Gentile woman. Martha, what happened? She gave up her last flour and oil for one more cake and gave it to Elijah. Why would she do that? Elijah told her the Lord said to do so. Yes. The Lord said that he would make it so that her flour and oil would never run out. And she believed. A pagan Gentile in a pagan land. And she was hungry enough to know she needed God and to obey him. And so God sent Elijah to multiply her food forever. What about Elisha and Naaman? There were many lepers in Israel during this time. But none of them were cleansed except Naaman. Only a Gentile, a Syrian soldier, an enemy of the Lord's people. But he was so desperate, he trusted Elisha. And his leprosy was cleansed. You may be the chosen seed of Abraham. You may be the people of the covenants. But that will not bring you my salvation. If you cannot accept that you are spiritually poor and captive in the same way that a Gentile woman and a Syrian leper recognize their need, if you do not realize that you need a year of the Lord's favor, And I cannot save you.
Who do you think you are? This is what Hara talked about. That he even called himself the Messiah. Are you claiming to be the Messiah? Or are you merely claiming to speak for the Lord as a prophet? Yes. You are a false prophet. <gasps> well, there is quite a thing to say. Jesus, maybe we should leave. Lazarus, you're his friend. You cannot be involved. You know what the law of Moses is. We are all his friends, Aaron. We cannot say things like this. Jesus, stand up at once. Rabbi, please. Rafi, come with Jesus and me. No. We will leave, and you can all continue the service. Rabbi Benjamin has asserted false prophecy. And I cannot argue. You said you saw the miracle. He's saying only he can save He us. did not use those words. It's what I meant. Jesus, you're not helping. Stop. He's saying we are not the Holy Ones chosen. Now, he did not say that. In words, a book of Moses. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak. That same prophet shall die. Rabbi Benjamin, I beg of you, not this. Lazarus, it's fine. Jesus, they are going to... Jesus, if you do not renounce your words, we will have no choice but to follow the law of Moses. I am the law of Moses. <laughs> Jesus bar Joseph. Because you have repeatedly prophesied falsely and have offered no denial or renouncement of your blasphemous claims, there is no need to escalate this to the authorities. Do you stand by all that you said? I think I was pretty clear. Your father, may he rest in peace, was a righteous man. Your mother is a good woman. You take no pleasure in the shame you are bringing to their name, nor the grief this will bring upon Mary. But as from the law of Moses, whose life and words you have spat upon today, your sentence is death. I think that communicates the the sentiment, the vibe that was happening that day uh, more than more than I can. But uh, I encourage you to watch the chosen. I put a link in this week's newsletter. Um, it's pretty good stuff. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that you used it then as Jesus read out that passage from Isaiah written 700 years before he was born and yet it described him. We ask Lord, that you'll use your word today to encourage us. Amen. 
Donald Rumsfeld was the US Secretary of Defense in that period that became known as the War on Terror after the Twin Towers were destroyed uh, in New York. I actually remember this press conference. You may as well. Uh, it's become relatively famous. Let's have a quick look. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. But, <laughs> excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just wondering I'm not this going, is an unknown unknown. I'm not going to say which it is. But, but okay. Mr. Secretary, you you know, I'm right here. If you I'm right something. here. And you want to remember that? Uh, one. Don't. Yes, no. Well, what Donald is trying to say there is that in the context of the war on terror is that there are things that we know. For example, we know that the terrorists are fighting in this particular place, be it Baghdad, Afghanistan. But there are also things we know that we don't know. For example, we know the terrorists are planning another attack but we don't know where or when, right? Makes sense. But there are also unknown unknowns. And probably the greatest example of that was the planes flying into the Twin Towers themselves. They had no idea at all that it was uh, about to happen. Completely unknown and completely unexpected. But this idea of known, of unknowns and unknown knowns can apply to ourselves. There is a thing in counselling called the Jahari window. Probably a few out there that might be familiar with this concept. The Jahari window is a visual representation of what you know about yourself. You see there on the left-hand column. Uh, what others know about you on the um, first horizontal column. Um, but the whole idea is that it is there to help a person with the aid of a counsellor to develop self-awareness and, and an understanding of others. I find the top right-hand box particularly interesting if not a bit scary, don't you? <laughs> when you think about, when you think about it, what people know about me that I don't know, what you all know about me that I don't know or I'm unaware of, or my, I don't know, quicks, quirks, things, I don't know. I don't know. Yet if we turn the tables on that idea, we probably don't have to think too hard, do we, for us to come up with some things about other people that we know about them that they don't know, that they're unaware of. Or perhaps they do know a little bit. They've just got no idea how annoying it really is for everyone else, perhaps. But the point is that there are things we either don't know or perhaps we've got wrong about ourselves, about how we perceive others or how we perceive the world, perhaps about what we believe and even about God. And while we may acknowledge the fact that we don't know things, that's fairly easy to acknowledge. We usually hate it if someone comes along and points those things out to us. Even if done gently, we can become defensive, we can dig our heels in, and we can reject the person, the messenger. 
or even worse. This is what's happening in this passage today. So if you have your Bibles open there at Luke 4, we'll dig into it. You see there that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the Judean wilderness where he was tempted, as we saw last week. But now in verse 14, he's traveled the 100 or so kilometers north back to the region of Galilee, his home region. So when he was tempted last week, we saw he's down here, which is a very arid region. And it's the whole, Israel's a pretty small place, about 100 odd k's up to Nazareth. But he also, before he went there, he was hanging around Capernaum and places like that, doing ministry before going back home. And in those places, Capernaum and that, he was performing miraculous signs. He was healing people. He was exercising demons and stuff, we read. But now he's back home where he grew up in Nazareth. There he was raised as a child. It was there that he trained and then worked as a carpenter until quite recently in terms of, of this passage. So he's now back among his family, friends, neighbours, and the members of the synagogue that he attended every week. They seem to be glad that the local boy had done well as some sort of itinerant rabbi or teacher, that is. But some of what they heard may have been embellished as it travelled along the grapevine, the 35 kilometres or so from Capernaum to Nazareth. See that he was invited to read the scripture and share from it. We read in verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. In that Old Testament book of Isaiah that Jesus read from, there is a person running pretty much through that book of Isaiah that is being described. He is both a suffering servant type figure, but he is also at the same time the saviour, the anointed Messiah. And the Jews had waited a long time for this promised Messiah. And expectation was very high at the time of Jesus because of the oppressive Roman occupation that they were under at the time. And they expected that when this Messiah arrived, he would be like, like this new king, this military figure riding on his white horse to come in and overthrow the Romans, kick them out and bring back the glory days of Israel like they had under King David. And he was going to restore their national power and their prestige once again among the nations. What they had before them in the synagogue was the bloke who fixed their roof a few months ago. who built them a table last year. And he's claiming today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
That meant, as that rabbi we saw understood, that he presumed to be their saviour and messiah. It's hard to tell what was more outrageous for the people in the synagogue that day, that the local chippy claimed to be the God-sent long-awaited messiah, or was it more offensive to them that he claimed that they needed saving? The word for the poor that Jesus uses here refers to the the pious or the, the godly poor. These are the humble who are open to God since they are usually the first to recognize how much they need and depend on God. They are the same ones that Jesus speaks of in the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To these spiritually open people, Jesus proclaims release, recovery of sight, and freedom from oppression. And as we heard in in that, that video excerpt, this idea of the Jubilee is also in this passage. The year of Jubilee occurred every 50 years in the Jewish calendar. And what it meant was that all the land that had been sold or transferred would return back to the the family of origin that had that land. So they might sell it to someone for 20 years and they could grow crops or something, perhaps get some rent, but then it would return back to them. It was also a time when debts were cancelled. And you know at the time that many servants were actually working to pay off debt and at that time their debt and the servants would one again, once again be freed. The year of Jubilee was a fresh start for everyone, a new opportunity. And Jesus proclaims this new start, offering that to this offer of his divine deliverance. Jesus proclaims that the offer of relief, sorry, Jesus proclaims this offer of release, but he also has the power to bring that about, not just talk about it. We see that throughout his miracles. He demonstrates his power to bring spiritual life by bringing physical healing to someone, to the particularly when, when the guy got lowered through the roof and he says, well, you know, if I can make him walk, I can forgive his sin. The initial response there of the congregation gathered there in verse 22 seems to be positive yet guarded. It's interesting to try and get the vibe on this this passage. That's why I, I wanted to show that as well. It seems there in verse 22, they give high marks for his oratory. Oh, he's a good speaker. Yeah, he's got gracious words. But they're coming from Joseph's son. Yet they also seem to want clarity on this bold claim far beyond Jesus' you know, tradey status. Jesus senses the ambiguity and the confusion of the moment and he knows that he's not there to be appreciated for his speaking ability. Jesus has a crucial spiritual issue that he wants to make the Jewish congregation of his hometown aware of. They are in grave danger. Yet they are completely blind and unaware of this spiritual reality. 
In their case, it might be an unknown unknown, but that doesn't make it any less real. And so Jesus addresses the elephant in the room that only he can see. And he does that first by revealing what they're thinking. See, they've all heard the rumours and the reports about the miracles and the healing that Jesus had been doing down the road in Capernaum. And what are they thinking? Oh, well, is he going to do that here? That would be cool, wouldn't it? Or is it all just hype and rumour? So Jesus says to them, verse 23, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what you have, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. And Jesus pauses. And I think between you know, at the end of that full stop, many there in that room hoped that Jesus' travelling miracle show would now be on the stage in Nazareth. But he continues, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Now, Jesus' listeners were well aware that the message from God that so many of the Old Testament prophets brought was rejected by their ancestors, by this disobedient nation. And it wasn't only the message, it was the prophets themselves that were rejected and some of them killed. But Jesus has now characterised his friends, his extended family, as disobedient people like these ancestors. Their offence was rising. And Jesus continues to expose their spiritual condition through these two Old Testament accounts. The first, where Jesus sent their own Jewish prophet, Elijah, to bless and save a Gentile widow because Israel had rejected the ministry of Elijah. Now, you've got to understand, this doesn't make sense unless you understand this whole Gentile thing, right? You've got Jews, Gentiles, and the Jews hate them. And when I say hate, I mean capital H. They despise them. Dirty, filthy, low life. That is how the Jews consider the Gentiles. And so then Jesus lays on some more. Oh, and what about that pagan, Gentile, Syrian general, Nahum? This guy was fighting a war against Israel not long ago, trying to kill them. He's their enemy. But he was healed of leprosy by God through Elisha the prophet. These examples compare the, the current era, the current people there that Jesus is talking to, to one of the darkest, spiritually darkest periods in Israel's history. And he's sort of saying, there's a lot in common. And so they're getting more offended. And these Gentiles that you despised seem to be more worthy of God's grace and God's ministry than you were. And you hate them. It's building, the tension's building. And Jesus is also warning there, his friends here in his hometown, that they must make a choice about him as well. To choose wrongly is to lose the opportunity for blessing, 
for true sight and for freedom. This is very, very serious because the opportunity for blessing holds the equal opportunity for condemnation, for judgment, if they get the choice wrong. John the Baptist made that clear as well beforehand. So here we see Jesus has revealed his identity. He's exposed their underlying self-righteousness, but he's done it for their own good. But they cannot see it. Few people can. And they hate having it exposed. And now they hate the messenger. So verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. The Jews had become... Arrogant, lazy, forgetting that their job was to invite people like Gentiles into the fullness of life, of spiritual sight and freedom that is found in God. Instead, they mistakenly decided they had exclusive access to God so that they could look down their nose at everyone else. Jesus is saying to them, when you think to yourself, I've got God, but I'm not interested, thank you, in sharing him with anyone else, it actually shows you never had God. It's pretty much the same mistake, is it not, of the older brother of the prodigal son when he refused to come to the party and celebrate the fact that his younger brother had come to his senses, come back to his father and was forgiven and restored. Mm. Go on. It's similar to the rich young ruler that approached Jesus that day, thinking that Jesus should be so impressed with him. It's the same mistake as having the plank in our own eye that prevents us from seeing the truth of our condition before a holy, pure, righteous and loving God. It's such a repeated theme in the Bible, I think, because it's such a common problem for me and probably for all of us. It's scary. It's scary in my experience to see how easy it is for us to fall into the trap that the Jews did of presumption, of assumption and privilege and subtle superiority and comfort and uncaring. I know I do. When I go into town and I see people of a, let's just say, a certain appearance, a certain demeanour, a certain way of speech and the language they use, and I think to myself, my goodness, particularly if there's a kid in their presence. And I wonder, how's that kid going? I actually think a lot more than my goodness, but let's just leave it at there. Hey? And then you know what happens? 
Jesus comes and he speaks to me in passages like this. And he says, who on earth do you think you are? You arrogant, self-righteous. You can finish the sentence. He says it to me. Have you completely forgotten the gospel of grace that you dare stand up here and preach to others? Do you think that you're in some sort of better category than them, more deserving of God's grace than others? I dare you. This is what Jesus is challenging the people in this passage with. And it's healthy for us to allow him to challenge us and reflect on it too, is it not? Humility is the only way, the right way to approach God. Humility is... So hard to find, isn't it? But humility allows us to listen, to receive, to take on board some truths about our blind spots that were previously unknown to us. Humility is the only way to understand the gospel because it is the first step in understanding and responding to the gospel. I try and uh, present truths and concepts graphically. I've been doing that a bit more lately. Uh, to, to, I think it helps us better understand. And we'll do that in a minute. But let's just first clarify what the gospel is. The word, Greek word, simply means good news. What is the good news of the gospel? It is that we have fallen so far short, so far short of God's best for us. There are times when we have defied him and ignored him and done the old blue eyes Frank Sinatra, did it my way. And in doing that, we have offended the Lord of all, the holy, pure, perfect, righteous creator of the universe and creator of us. And because we've done that, he has the right to get a little bit angry about our behavior. I like the, the description of sin used in the, um, the, the, the little gospel thing I use, I forget what it's called now, senior moment, but it says living when we live in God's world as if God doesn't exist. I think that's pretty cool. And yet despite what we have done and despite the fact that he's not quite happy about that, despite all that, at the same time, he loves us so much that he says, if you'll just come to me and let me, I will take all that stuff, that sin, that guilt, that shame, I'll take it off of you and onto me. And there on that cross, I'll take the punishment that it deserves, that we deserve. And not only that, I'll take that off you, but I'll give you my righteousness, my right standing before God so that you come into that place of relationship with him, of being one of his children. And I will forgive you and I will wash you whiter than snow as you come in repentance and I'll give you a fresh new star with me as your saviour and your Lord. That is the gospel. 
If you do nothing to earn it or deserve it, it's just offered freely. And so the gospel worldview that Jesus was expressing to his people in his hometown, there is no room whatsoever for that sort of subtle or perhaps not so subtle sense of superiority that, uh, that can creep into my life, perhaps yours. And so I try to figure a way to compare perhaps the gospel, the true gospel, and this false gospel worldview. It can be subtle, but let's just think about some of these things. In the true gospel worldview, we feel the burden of sin in light of a holy God. The false gospel worldview, we're not overly aware or concerned about my sin in light of God's perfection or perhaps even how it might affect others around me. In the gospel worldview, we humbly acknowledge our weakness, our spiritual blindness and our poverty. In the false gospel worldview, we see others as weak and poor and blind. The gospel worldview, we recognize that I need forgiveness and help each day to live the life God wants me to, which is different to not seeing my need at all and not asking for forgiveness or help much at all. We can acknowledge that Jesus is the one who is offering it and who can deliver upon what he's offering. Or we can think, oh, Jesus is pretty cool, yeah, but I don't really need what he's offering, thanks. I don't need him to interfere with my day-to-day -day life. I'll just keep him at arm's length. Nice guy. But just keep your distance. I recognize that I'm dependent on Jesus for salvation and enabled by him to live as he wants me to each day. Or I usually depend on myself to live the way I think that God wants me to each day. I think this is an interesting one. In a gospel worldview, we're happy to see people enthusiastic, on fire for the Lord, gives us great joy. When we think about a false gospel, we're a bit suspicious or perhaps we resent other people's enthusiasm. Perhaps it's a bit immature or something. In the gospel worldview, we welcome all. Red and yellow, black and white, shapes, colours, socioeconomic status, whatever, we've got a big front door. In the false gospel, as, as we see the 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 as we saw in this passage, they welcome people. Oh, for sure, I'll welcome you as long as the same as me. And when we're operating out of a gospel worldview, we recognize we're in a struggle, spiritual struggle. Prayer is tough, constant distractions trying to make that time for the Lord. Recognize, ah, oh, I messed up again, but I'm coming to God for his grace and forgiveness. It's a dynamic. It's a struggle. It's happening. But on the other hand, we can just get busy doing my life, not really considering the spiritual dimension, just in my own bubble. The sad reality was that the people of Nazareth were blind and unaware of their, of their spiritual condition, of the truth of that. And that is the case, not just for them, 
but for every person that has walked on this planet bar one, Jesus himself. So it's a big boat that we're all in, actually. And the sad thing is that blindness remains when we think we're not blind. Because that stops us receiving the gospel of grace. Now, for sure, there is a journey and a work of God in the process of coming to acknowledge our condition and acknowledging, recognize the fullness of who Jesus is, Son of God, Saviour, Messiah, and with that comes the ability to change our condition. And praise God, many of us have come to that place. He's brought us on that journey. And we know that and we can be secure in that, in the work he's done for us, but that's just the beginning. We need to remember that I certainly do have a tendency to go back to those old attitudes about me and other people. And in doing that, we tend to lose the wonderful new sight, freedom and joy and the love that Jesus gives us and that we have experienced, and he's wanting us to receive more of from him. Maintaining that right Christian worldview is not a one-off, but a continuous, ongoing, daily, moment-by-moment -moment process of humility with every choice we make. It doesn't matter that, that we were baptised as a baby or confirmed or did this or that. or We need to come to him in humility to start the ball rolling and then we need to continue in that. I try to send an encouraging little meme or quote to my family most days. This is one I did this week. I thought it was pretty relevant. Let's get into the habit of asking yourself, does this, this, this activity, this thing, what I'm taking in, what I'm reading, what I'm watching, how I'm spending my time, what I'm buying, whatever, does this support the best life that God has for me? Good question to ask many times through the day. As we ask God to help us answer that question, he's glorified. And in that, as we're going to sing shortly, his kingdom is built up. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we are so thankful that you offer that grace, that mercy, propelled by your immense love for us. And that's there, that's there when we're indifferent to you. That's there just waiting for us to respond. Lord, help us to do that. Do that for the first time. And we need to do that continually because we drift. And we need new sight, new freedom, new love, new joy pretty regularly. Keep us close to you in your precious name. Amen.